Hello folk, how you doing? Scotty. So I had been requested to make this argument on the falling rate of profit and basically it's an argument made by Karl Marx. I've came across a few of the Marxist arguments themselves, the critique on capitalism. Apparently it's this critique that capitalism is inevitably fail from it. So I decided to do a wee bit of research into it to find out what this argument's all about and I've made a similar argument before with regards to the labour theory of value. The falling rate of profit means that over time there is a tendency for the overall profitability of enterprises to fall. In simple terms, businesses would make more money in the past than in the present or future. But essentially this, you know, falling rate of profit idea, competition will lower their costs and of course prices and that will lead to a rat race to the bottom because other competitors will then theoretically lower their prices and costs etc and before you know it, no profit margin left, there's no profits left, therefore it will inevitably lead to apparently this collapse in the industry and therefore the collapse of capitalism. But this doesn't, you know, live up to the real world because they don't understand subjective value and this is what it really all boils down to in relation to the labour theory of value. What you need to understand when it comes to Marxists, Marxists view value as something objective. Of course there's certain socialists that try to argue with this, which is deeply flawed because that is essentially how they view view value looks at value as objective because they think it's something endogenous when it comes to price. So they think it's a, a, a case that price can be determined, you know, solely down to the labour quantity in relation to the average necessary labour time. So how long on average it takes to produce something in relation to the quantity of labour that they have. That is deeply flawed because that isn't what value is based off of. It's down to what you your personal opinion is on something. I gave that prime example when it came to contrapoints because she really didn't understand the first thing to do with value. She's pointing out about this to do with the expense of, you know, shoes in the shop or whatever and even then starts to illustrate about that of the gold pizza that's $2,000. When you turn back to that of Shane Killian's argument, he is absolutely spot on. It's not something intrinsic, it's something that's subjective, just like the difference between the McDonald's burger to that of the burger made by Burger King, they are not the same. So it's all about your subjective value, your opinion, what do you prefer? It's your subjective opinion over how much you spend. For example, you might go for something cheaper. You might find phones that cost £250 or maybe £200. You might go for that, that's your subjective value. But then you'll find other phones that are worth, you know, £600 upwards to £800, etc. It's all down to your subjective value on something. You know, you might, you know, pay out a lot more because of the quality of the product. You know, it's a bit like myself as a photographer. I'm looking to go into pet photography, but I'm going to have to look at my own market value due to an experience, which is number one, because it's okay having experience using a camera in other fields. Maybe it's like landscape, etc. Something to show in my portfolio, like for example, that to do with wildlife photography. That's a different experience to that of, you know, photographing things like that of pets. Since I've not got anything there, for that of pet photography. So I've got to look at my own market value. It's all down to my own, you know, skills, etc. My own experience for what I can then get away with charging in relation to my competition, of course. No wrong argument with regards to saying that competition may force other competitors to drive down their cost prices d depending how that is and it doesn't necessarily say that that's a, a definitive answer it's just like how someone may be a wedding photographer and they can get away with charging two thousand pounds and that's really all down to the subjective value of the consumer are they willing to pay for that for that person in terms of starting off i might only get away with charging a hundred and 50, maybe 200 pounds or something like that for the type of work that I would end up doing. Again, that's based off of my own relative skills. Or, or experience for whatever reason being you know that's not to say that the person who has a portfolio has better 
you know, skills than the person who doesn't. You know, it's not as simplistic as that. It's all down to subjective value. So, you know, it's no different to that when you speak about outside, when you talk about clothing. Now, I did receive a comment over the weekend about how good these are. So they're $11.98. This pink is definitely no, it comes with the belt, pockets, and that's what the back looks like. You know, not everybody holds the same value in clothing. It's the same thing with that of music and, of course, games. Two games, obviously. Red I know, Death. I know. You need to get this crystal. Get this. And everything else to do with maybe it's films, etc. We don't all hold the same value in these products. For example, I'm someone that holds high value in the type of films like Lord of the Rings or Pirates of the Caribbean, but you found there's many people who gave poor reviews of the latter films of Pirates of the Caribbean. But then again, that's all down to people's subjective value. Again, that's not something that Marxists seem to comprehend. That value isn't something as simple as saying, here's the average necessary labour time, here's, of course, the quantity of labour that goes into producing it, because if that was the case, then of course, the film Robert LeBruce would have been valuable, because a lot of labour time went into it. The average necessary labour time for producing the films, that of the labour quantity, a lot of people went into producing it. You know, judging by their logic, it would have been a very valuable film, but nobody went to see it. So at the end of the day, how valuable was it? It wasn't very valuable. It's no different to an illustrative example that the two Soviet Union economists gave, Nikolai Shmelev and Vladimir Popov, where they spoke about the warehouse example of the moleskin pelts. They were left to rot in warehouses. Now, a lot of labour time would have went into that, a lot of, you know, that to do with the labour quantity, but that doesn't necessarily mean to say that it was of value. This is the thing that they completely ignore, that they don't acknowledge, that they don't understand. That's why the $2,000 gold pizza sells. The $2,000 gold pizza sells because there's people willing to pay that amount for whatever reason being a gold pizza. And who am I to judge them? Argue with them over what their value is for something. If they want to part with $2,000 to buy a $2,000 gold pizza good for them that's their own perspective that's their own value and there's nothing stopping you going elsewhere to a, another business and buying a six dollar or an eight dollar or a ten dollar a twelve dollar you know pizza and the only reason why a company can get away with selling a two thousand dollar gold pizza is simply because they have people willing to part with their money if there were people who weren't willing to part with their money that business would be forced to reduce the price because otherwise it's not going to sell. That's how the real world works. Going by their falling rate of profit argument, they're saying this company just decides to lower their prices, that forces all the others to do the same. It becomes a rat race to the bottom until there's no profit margin left and therefore the entire thing collapses. Or that the capitalist economy has a tendency to lose money in the long run. This happens because an individual capitalist wants to make more and more money for himself. He can either do this by investing in technology to make labor more efficient, or to make his workers labor harder. Doing the latter can only be done under certain conditions. If there exists strong unions or another firm which wants these laborers, this will be detrimental to the capitalists. So a good way to do this is therefore to make labor more efficient, invest in technology, and other methods to maximize the efficiency of production. Once a breakthrough in efficiency is made, the capitalists can implement this within their firms. They can now make more of a product, allowing them to distribute it at a lower price. So this firm is now making a ton of money, more than the competition. They now have more money to expand their businesses, create jobs, offer higher wages, creating an economic boom. The other businesses in our market must therefore adapt to this or go out of business. They must also seek this new way of making labor more and more efficient. Once they do, more businesses can re from this boom. However, once this is no longer unique, the price of the product would have been dropped, yet there's no longer any edge that any firms have over the competition. So we're back where we started. However, the product is now cheaper, since labor is more efficient, there is an increased supply of this product. There are too many products for everyone to consume, and they can consume it at a much lower price. This means that the economy cannot keep up with this boom, and the profitability of the enterprise has therefore fell, giving us a crisis. Doesn't work like that in the real world. It's just like a photographer who doesn't use flash. They might use just natural light photography, and they get away with it. It's not something they can, you know, absolutely define. That isn't the real world. And everybody's value is all different from one another.
another. So this is the issue, just like how you all have different value for games, in, in other words, I might value something like the strategy games that involve money, like the Roller Coaster Tycoon series, in relation to House Flipper or thing like that, that other people might find a load of garbage, they might prefer playing COD, etc, you know, shooting people, or, you know, people prefer playing platform games, or if it's not that, they might prefer playing the sports games, and some people prefer just playing that to do with these type of games, that's the issue. Nobody holds the same value in games. They're, they're not all the same. It's no different to films and it's no different to music. Take for example, I'm someone that's heavily into that of trance music. I'm someone that loves Giuseppe Ottaviani. Other people probably think that's just a load of garbage. Who am I to judge them and who are they to judge me? You know, that's just how things are. We're not all the same. But for whatever reason being, socialists seem to think that value is something that can be t determined as internally. And Ludwig von Mises, like I said, numerous times before and I'll say it again, Ludwig von Mises made the argument and stated that in terms of value you have to ask the questions over who is it valuable to, number one, in terms of what time is it valuable, again that's not something Karl Marx looked at, in relation to what other given products at that time, for example, you'll see technology changes all the time. Now these typically do hold their value over time but in terms of camera bodies they tend to change value very quickly. First of all, not everybody's going to hold the same value. They might prefer uh, a different lens. This is an 85mm lens, so, you know, for whatever reason being, people might prefer, you know, a different focal length. No different to that of the, the time. Like I said, in terms of time, they might prefer uh, something else. So for example, summer clothing is going to change its value when you enter the autumn and winter period depending where you live, and it's not going to be the same between the places. For example, I gave the example of New York compared to Florida. Florida's hot all year round, compare that to New York where it's, you know, snows during the winter period. They're not going to hold the same value for summer clothing as you enter the autumn and winter period because it's going to be colder. Value isn't fixed over time, and even then you've got the argument about how things change because new technology comes out, new cameras come out, you know lenses come out, so of course your value will change over time with that, just like that with the falling rate of profit. It's not as simple as saying, oh well, you know, at the end of the day someone decides to cut their costs, reduce their prices, etc. It leads to the other one doing the exactly the same, and it isn't necessarily the case. In the real world, and it's just like the example when you look at the predatory pricing example, what did you see with that of Herbert Dow? chemical company, the predatory pricing, where of course the German cartel tried to charge less by slightly reducing the prices below their competition, he tried to wipe out Herbert Dow. What did Herbert Dow do? Well Herbert Dow was charging about 36 cents or 38 cents to the dollar and he continued on charging that. Now despite the fact that the German cartel continued to reduce the prices to try and wipe out his competition, in theory by socialists, the like of Herbert Dow would have been wiped out, but that wasn't the case. Again, people were just continuing to spend the money at Herbert Dow's company despite the higher price because at the end of the day, they hold the value in that company, they hold value in a trusted company because a company has a reputation to look after and the reputation's a big thing. They might pay out the higher price because it's of a higher quality. They might pay out the higher price simply because they just love the company, whatever it may be, it's just how things are. But they seem to think that it's just as simple simple as saying, well here's this company, they charge cheaper, therefore it's just inevitable that it'll wipe out their competition. Didn't work. Didn't happen in the real world. All Herbert Dow did was he got agents to go and buy up the bromine at the cheaper price from the German cartel and he was selling it off at the higher price. That's what you see in the real world and you even see it in auction sites. People do this all the time. They buy up the cheaper goods and they sell it off at the higher price. We can actually look at from what is stated about Ludwig von Mises' uh, argument on the whole thing to do with the rate of profit. Just listen to this. So as stated by the Mises Institute, they say, according to Mises, rate of profit is an absurd expression based on the false assumption that there exists a relationship between profit and capital. Profits are earned by superior foresight in adapting production to meet future shifts in consumer demand before competitors are aware of the need for such adaptation. 
since profits cannot be related mathematically to superior foresight, there can be no meaningful rate of profit. So in other words, the Marxists that I came across who were making this critique of capitalism, they were pretty much trying to correlate this whole thing between the rate of profit, profits to that with that of capital, and the real world again does not work like that. It's this whole argument that they are making that's based on just theory, it's not based on the real world, they don't understand what value is, and it's really all subjective over price, it's subjective over what you are willing to pay for something. Time preference is another thing. Time preference can be a very important thing as well, because if there's a limited amount of time set on something, and you see this all the time, where businesses set a limited time on sales. I know a company that did this, and they do this quite often, Topaz Labs do that. They make a limited offer to people in terms of sales. They say, well, for a limited amount of time, we'll give you this certain amount off this product. And of course, you can get this product for maybe a 25% discount, or some companies even give 75%, you know, off or whatever. You get a limited amount of time. And believe it or not, because of that limited time preference, um, your value, your, your demand drives up. Um, simply because of the change of things, how businesses strategically set things out. It's all of these things Marxists don't look at because they've got a linear thought process. They think, oh, a burger. Eh, as if to say, all burgers are the same. As if to say, all, you know, produce is just the same. Everything is just so linear. It's like toothpaste is all the same. It's like, <laughs> the world doesn't work like that. How things are in, in, in practice is a very different world to their theoretical perspective. You know, some people just prefer going through Apple because, well, it might cost them more, but they trust them more. So I hope that covers the whole thing on the falling rate of profit. It's deeply flawed. The real world doesn't work like that. They're not just going to, you know, lower their prices and costs, etc., to that of competition. Sometimes it's the case, it's not always the case. It's not as simple as that. You know, it's just one of these things. Again, if you've got any questions you would like to ask, fire away in the comment section below. And of course, I'll be sure to get back to you. Be sure to like the video, share the video. And of course, thank you for watching. And what can I say, folk? Marxists just don't live in the real world. Cheers.